wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Fuad Kassab. Welcome to A Quirky Journey. This is your host, Fuad Kassab, and with me, I have the most incredible co-host on the planet, <laughs> Joe Witten. Hello, Jojo. Hello, Fufu. And Why are you laughing? Do you I'm... not believe what I'm saying? <laughs> I always laugh when you praise me up. I just think it's funny. This is like our most exciting podcast ever because we have one of our heroes, probably our main hero on this podcast, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. So um, when we started GAPS, obviously. One second, one yeah. second. Can you hear Sophie saying mama? Yes. In the I don't know, she's gone on a, on a mama rampage. You keep talking <laughs> and I'll go try to calm, calm her down. Okay. It's all right. Uh, I think most of you have kids and understand, right? Okay, so um, we began GAPS with studying Dr. Natasha's amazing book, Gut and Psychology Syndrome, and um, that was such an eye-opener for us and for many, many people. And um, we are so excited to be able to have Dr. Natasha herself on the podcast today. So for those of you who don't know much about Dr. Natasha... Um, she's a medical doctor with two postgraduate degrees. So she's Master of Medical Sciences in Neurology and Master of Medical Sciences in Human Nutrition. And she's been um, working as a neurologist for over 20 years and um, working with nutrition. And she has um, helped many, many people work through really serious health problems um, and conditions that you wouldn't think could be changed. But what I love about Dr. Natasha is her um, common sense, traditional wisdom approach to food and um, healing. And you'll really hear it in the podcast with her. So I'm not going to um, spoil it by telling you anything about it, but it's just so beautiful to see the way that she um, uses the, both her medical training and the traditional wisdom learned from her grandmother and from her culture being raised in a village in Russia with the traditional foods for healing. Um, and just going back to those beautiful, nourishing, nutrient-dense healing foods that we all should be eating as part of our everyday diet and how that makes such a difference um, in our health when we do that, um, which we should be always, we should have never gone away from, but... Um, you know, our industrial mechanistic view of food has um, really ruined health in our Western society and she's um, really helping people to get back to real food and healing with food. So it's really beautiful to talk to her. Um, one of the things that we wanted to mention in this podcast, because we know it's something people have asked about a lot in our GAPS groups, is um, the kombucha question. So uh, people used to say don't have kombucha on GAPS intro, um, wait until later to bring it in. And um, Dr. Natasha explains that it's actually fine on early intro as long as it's um, done the right way because it's really full of vitamins and minerals and things that will really help with healing. So um, for those of you who've been avoiding kombucha on intro, you'll be very happy to hear about this. Um, some people have... Uh, we have um, Elise that comes onto our podcast, the GAPS practitioner, and she sent us the um, latest information from Dr. Natasha on um, kombucha and how to make it. Um, and then when we talked to her, she kind of gave us another viewpoint. So I just wanted to mention that because some people have said, um, okay, so trying to explain this, um, Natasha, Dr. Natasha mentioned in an interview that she did with Becky Plotner and five other um, GAPS practitioners in America that it was fine to have kombucha made with sugar as long as it was fermented for like three weeks until it was it had really eaten up all that sugar and you could have that from right from stage one and that was okay. In this podcast, she talks about how she prefers to make it with honey 
and um, that's how she makes it at home. So she makes, she said you can use a regular kombucha scoby and you can make it with honey and then you don't have to ferment it as long. Um, it will actually be fine earlier because you're using honey, not sugar, and then it won't taste as sour. Of course, that way is more expensive, so it's up to you. And she sort of says stage two or three for some people, but it's so individual. And what we got from this was the fact that um, when you go into a healing diet like GAPS, don't get the idea that there's only one right way to do everything. You've got to have the flexibility um, to realize that it's going to be a little bit different for every person. Um, And Dr. Natasha talks about this beautifully in this podcast and also in the article that she wrote. um, It's called One Man's Meat is Another Man's Poison. So look that up. We'll put the link in the show notes. But a lot of of people get so hung up on rules and regulations and they want everything to be black and white. And I think that's human nature. It simplifies things if we can just know the black and white, but life's not like that. And there's a lot of things in our diets and with healing um, that are just going to be individual and we need to work through it ourselves and figure out what works for us. And Dr. Natasha is um, just, she speaks so beautifully about this, like her, her upbringing with food, um, what she learnt, and she makes it really clear that it is there's basic principles for health and for for healthy eating and for healing, but you have to take those principles and you have to um, work them into your life um, in a way that suits your body, um, so that you can heal at your own rate. And I don't think it's the same for everyone. And Dr. Natasha explains this in the podcast so that's something that i really got out of it are you back for what i've been back for uh, so long i've just been waiting oh i'm sorry you could have interrupted no you were in such a beautiful flow i didn't oh. I, I had nothing to add to that oh so. <laughs> thank you yeah, okay did you did you want to say anything about that did i explain it well yeah like i'll say it in like my masculine way which okay. is guys just relax please just yeah. relax a little bit <laughs> Um, it's just funny when we were doing GAPS and, you know, we've got the online gut health program and everyone's like, no, this is GAPS legal or, you know, the, the word legal and illegal comes in and yeah. all of a sudden it, it puts this kind of um, fear as if like, I'm going to put you in jail. For it, it just brings like, fear into it, you. don't you think? It's yeah, like, and, <gasps> and I'm doing it wrong. It's like there's so much rigidity. And, and yeah. When you talk to her, she's like, we're talking about real food here and uh, trying to heal with it. So my impression from her conversation is that she's put gaps in a, in a structured way so that, um, you know, you can take people through the the phases of healing your gut. But she doesn't seem overly concerned with sticking to it like like it's sort of law. She mm. That's not, way, not the way that she formulated no. it. She's, She's giving you an, an algorithm or an approach to heal, not like a rigid formula. Mm. And you have to be tuned into your body and yes. you have to be able to work with that. And she's much more relaxed than um, you would imagine about it. And it seems that we take it a little bit too seriously in terms of making sure that everything is not lined up in the right mm. place. So just relax a little bit and um, you hopefully you get that impression from her as well so that that aspect that you bring into your healing journey of just relaxing itself will be healing yes reduce the stress Absolutely. we've talked about this a lot in the past few podcasts um about being gentle with yourself and um you know just working through things patiently and slowly and not beating yourself up if you think you did something wrong because a lot of the things that we you know, we look back and say in our own family, we didn't do gaps um, strictly to every rule, but we healed. So there's mm-hmm. there's a lot to be said for um, just working through the principles of something and figuring out what's, what works exactly for you. So Great. So, guys, we'll uh, leave you to listen to the podcast. We hope you enjoy it. We'd love to hear from you. And if you really like it, a couple of things you can do. One is give it a five-star rating on iTunes so that more and more people can know about it and two, share it with your friends. Just copy the link, put it in your social media, hit that share button 
uh, send it to all your Facebook friends who are annoyed by how healthy you're getting. And, uh, <laughs> oh, I have and just to... get them on that journey. I have to tell you something, Fouad. I forgot yes. to tell you this. Um, the other day, my sister was t- talking to her sister-in-law and she said, hey, I saw that article in the paper about Joe and that big photo of her and she hadn't seen me for years. She goes, oh, my goodness, she looks so well. What is she doing? We want to know. We want to know about this cookbook. We want to buy it. <laughs> oh, wow. See? So there you go. Like once you start healing and, and you look different and your friends see you and go, oh, my goodness, what are you doing? I think that's the time when it's perfect time to share, um, to share without hassling people about, changing their health they'll see they'll see the difference and then you can tell them it's awesome exactly and and you'll be fired up to teach them as well because your brain's working better yes (laughs) and she she talks a lot about brain health in this podcast and the heart health comes from the yeah from the gut to the brain um really really important podcast guys can't stress it on so we'll just go quiet now and leave you with the world's expert on gut health dr natasha camel right awesome A great big welcome today to Dr. Natasha. We are so excited to have you with us. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Fuad is here and me, Joe, and um, all of our listeners uh, have been sending messages saying, I'm so, I'm so excited about this podcast. And people who haven't listened to our podcast yet are saying, oh, my goodness, how do I get onto this podcast? <laughs> so Wonderful. Created a bit of excitement. Um, it's our number this, 100 episode. Yeah, and, um, it's number 100. We started the show because of GAPS, and to have you here for the, the 100th episode is fantastic. Thank, thank you so much for joining us. We're really, really excited. I'm delighted to be here. So um, I'll just give a little bit, bit of background. Since it's the 100th episode, I just have to say why it started. So when we began GAPS, for um, mostly for my son Isaac, um, to help him heal from severe OCD, anxiety, all of the phobias and fears and things that he was going through. That was our main purpose for starting. Um, it was all very raw at first and we couldn't share. It was very difficult to share. And um, so then when we'd gone through intro for a couple of months, um, it became really um important to me to share our message and I think Isaac got to the stage where he was like mum I need to help other kids with this and so we um, decided to start the podcast about six months after our after we started intro and um, that was our way to sort of share with people what we were doing and how it was working and um, it's just gone on since then so how many years is that it's probably about three or four years now three and a half I can't remember three it would be three years. Yeah, but so, it's, it's been life-changing. So, so, Dr. Natasha, thank you so much, as we said, for yeah. on the show. And uh, Joe's got a, a whole bunch of questions for you today. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, do you want to kick it off? Yes. Um, so, first of all, I just want to say thank you from the people in the Gut Health Program because they wanted me to, to let you know how much they appreciate what you've done and um, helping all of us with our health like you have. But we would love to hear from you your story, how... How did this all start? How did you um, see the need for this kind of protocol and how did you start to develop it and what was your actual family story? It's a very similar story to yours, Joe, and to millions of mothers around the world. Yeah. As I said at the conference in Australia, mothers are my heroes. These yeah. are the ladies that are changing the world now. And uh, I had a, my first child developed autism. Uh, he was diagnosed at the age of three. Mm-hmm. And very quickly, I discovered that my own profession had absolutely nothing to offer my son. And that was unacceptable. So that threw me into a very steep learning curve, trying to find a solution uh, for his problem. And that's how GAPS Nutritional Protocol was born. I was already a medical doctor, already was a neurologist. <clears throat> so I went back to university and studied human nutrition in detail and read, I don't know how many books, and mm-hmm. how many conferences and the result of all of that is that my son now is in his mid-20s and he's living a normal life he's awesome. put all that behind us a long long time ago and as I was getting success with him uh, 
the community of other uh, parents with autistic children were all talking to each other. We were all helping each other because there was no mainstream help available at all at that time. That was 90s, 1990s. Mm-hmm. And uh, I started helping other families and that's how my clinic was born. And as I was working with autistic children, there were other children in these families and I've discovered that they have digestive issues and allergies and asthma and migraines mm-hmm. and they clean and they're fussy with food. And quite a few of them have hyperactivity, ADHD, ADHD, ADD, and dyslexia and dyspraxia. Some have epilepsy. And the parents are not well themselves. Mm -hmm. A lot of mothers and fathers in these families had uh, irritable bowel syndrome or other digestive disorders, migraines, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, multiple sclerosis, chronic cystitis, psoriasis, eczema, a whole uh, uh, list of various disorders. And I realized that all of those conditions stem from the same place, from the same place, Mm. from the gut, from the digestive system. And that's how gut and psychology syndrome was born, which then my patients later on abbreviated to GAPS, because it's a long, uh, long Mm. string of words, obviously. And as I was uh, working with these patients, I realized that not just the brain is affected, the rest of the body is affected as well. Other organs in the body are affected too. Uh, by the same problem in the gut. So I created a second syndrome called gut and physiology syndrome, which in the English language, thankfully, abbreviates to the same gaps, <laughs> gut and psychology and gut and physiology syndrome. And the list of various disorders uh, is long that uh, this protocol helps and uh, it's getting longer. So basically what we have with a gaps person, we have a person with abnormal gut flora. Recent research has discovered that 90% of all cells in a human body is in our gut flora. 90%. Wow. Mm-hmm. So our body is just a shell. Uh, 10%. Yeah. It, it, it's just a shell. It's a habitat for this mass of microbes mm. that live inside us. And I'm afraid they're in charge, not us. They're mm-hmm. very much in charge. Mm. They are rich. Uh, is not only in the digestive system. They reach to every organ, every cell, every tissue in the body, no matter how far away that organ might be from the digestive system. The brain is far enough. And what happens when a person, a child or an adult has abnormal gut flora? First of all, they can't digest their food well. So they don't uh, nourish their bodies very well. And as a result, they develop multiple nutritional deficiencies. At the same time, various pathogenic microbes that take over the digestive system of the person damage the integrity of the gut wall, making it porous and leaky. It becomes like a sieve. So foods don't get the chance to be digested properly before they absorb. They absorb in a partially broken down form, maldigested. And then the immune system finds them in the bloodstream, looks at them and says, you're not food. I don't recognize you as food and attacks them. It attaches various cells and various complexes to that undigested bit of food. And these complexes then, wherever they get to in the body, they cause symptoms. And these are the symptoms of food allergy and intolerance. We have now a majority of the population in the English-speaking world, more than 70%, who have food allergies and intolerances. People react to all kinds of foods. And that means there's nothing wrong with the food. What's happening is your gut wall is like a sieve. You don't have a chance to digest that food before it absorbs. What we want to do is to focus on healing and sealing the gut wall, closing up all those little holes in the gut wall. So the food then, once that happens, the food has a chance to be digested properly before it absorbs and food allergies and intolerances disappear (coughs) in the person. At the same time, what happens uh, when these pathogens overgrow in the digestive system, they eat the food that comes along and convert it into hundreds of very toxic chemicals, downright poisonous. And all of those poisonous chemicals also absorb into the bloodstream, into the lymph, get distributed around the body. And wherever they get to, they would cause symptoms as well. So the digestive system in these people, instead of being a source of nourishment, becomes a major source of toxicity in the body. A river of undigested food, toxins, alive microbes get through to, flows from the gut into the blood, into the lymph, get distributed around the body, and basically poisons the person. What happens with autism? 
vast majority, more than 95-97% of these children are born with a perfectly normal brain. These were perfectly normal children when they were born. Mm. The problem is these children acquired abnormal gut flora from their parents at the moment of birth because <clears throat> that's where gut flora comes from. It comes from mommy and daddy. So if mommy and daddy have abnormal gut flora, that's exactly what they pass to their child at the moment of birth. Whether the child was born uh, naturally or through cesarean section, um, they still acquire their gut flora from the parents. <clears throat> and these children begin their life with abnormal gut flora while they are purely breastfed, exclusively breastfed, because breast milk doesn't require digestion, it's the perfect best food for a human baby. They can thrive and they can grow during breastfeeding. But as soon as other foods start getting introduced or formula gets added to the regimen, this pathogenic flora starts feeding on those things and start turning the gut into a, a source of toxicity in the body. This river of toxicity gets into the brain of the child because the very chemicals in the gut which open up the gut to invasion do the same to the blood-brain barrier. When they reach that uh, barrier that protects the brain, <clears throat> they damage it, its, its integrity and making it porous and leaky. So this toxic river coming from the gut gets straight into the brain of the child and clogs it with toxicity. How do babies learn? If you observe a little baby, they listen to everything, they look at everybody, they stare at people, they touch everything, they take everything in their mouth. What are they doing? They're using their sensory organs to collect information from the environment. Their hearing, their vision, their tactile sensitivity, their smell buds and, and their taste buds. They're using all those organs, they collect information from the environment, and then these organs pass that information to the brain to be processed. And in a healthy child, from this information, the brain learns. The child learns that this is mommy, this is daddy, uh, I can trust them, this is a toy, I play with it like this, this is food, I eat it, these are other children around, I copy them. But if the child's brain is clogged with toxicity, it cannot process that information appropriately. All that information coming from ears, eyes, tactile sensitivity, and other sensory organs turns into a noise, into a mush in the child's brain. And from that noise, the brain cannot learn anything useful. That is why autistic children very often don't know their mommy and daddy. Mommy and daddy don't mean any more than any other human being around. They are known to pick up a hand of any stranger on the street and try to walk away with that stranger, with mommy running behind and screaming his name. Because mommy doesn't mean any more than any, anybody else. They don't know what to do with toys. They don't know what to do with other children. They don't know how to copy. They don't know what to do with food. The child develops uh, autism as a result. So this was a perfectly healthy, normal child, but it got poisoned. The brain of this child got poisoned. That is why the child develops autism. If the mixture of toxicity is different, constitution of the child is different, then the child may not become autistic, but become hyperactive or dyslexic, or dyspraxic, or oppositional defiant, or obsessive compulsive, or something else, another mixture of symptoms may develop in this child. And indeed, more than 80% of these children have a unique picture, because they have a unique mixture of toxins bombarding their poor little brain. So they have a unique clinical picture, which doesn't fit into any diagnostic box. They have a bit of autism and a bit of ADHD and a bit of dyslexia, a bit of dyspraxia, a bit of something else. And these are the children with whom uh, pediatricians procrastinate. They ask the mother and the father to bring the child for observation six months later and then six months later. And mm -hmm. precious time is being wasted when the child could have been helped. You are the parents of the child. You know something's wrong. You can feel it in your heart. Don't wait for a diagnostic label because it's not going to help. It's not going to do anything for your child. Mm. Start the GAPS nutritional protocol. What it will do, it will change the gut flora of the child, normalize it, drive out pathogens, and reestablish normal healthy uh, microbes in there. It will heal and seal the gut wall, stop it from being leaky and porous. And as a result, that river of toxicity stops. And the brain cleans up. Because the brain and the rest of our organs in the body have a wonderful ability to clean themselves. They are doing it all the time. Every second of our existence, they're cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. So as soon as that river of toxicity stops, the brain has a chance to clean itself up 
and the child wakes up. The child comes out of that toxic fog. And from that moment on, the child is able to learn normally and properly. The age uh, uh, when that moment happens is very important. Obviously, the younger the child is when that moment happens, the quicker they will recover from autism and the more fully they will recover. The older the child is, the more difficult it will be for them to recover and the more uh, uh, less fully they may recover from the disorder because they've missed uh, too much of their development. You see, children have to learn certain skills at a certain window of opportunity, at a certain age. We have to learn to walk around uh, the age of one. We have to learn to talk around the age of two. Then uh, in, in the third and fourth year, we develop syntaxes and, and other complicated aspects of the language and social um, skills. And if the child missed that age, missed that window, because he was stuck in that toxic fog and his brain could not function because it was poisoned, then it's very difficult for the child later on to relive that and redevelop those skills. At that point, when the child wakes up and comes out of that toxic fog, you have to intensively teach those skills to your child. And the best uh, teaching protocol that I know of is applied behavior analysis, ABA. Oh, okay. There are many programs around now, but I, I, ABA definitely provides the most reliable results. It's an intensive program, uh, and the parents are trained. It's not just teachers that are teaching the child. The parents are trained, and the child pretty much is uh, taught every waking hour, every waking minute to catch wow. up, catch up, catch up. Also, what we have to understand that uh, healthy children of the same age are not standing still. They're developing at a very fast rate. Children develop so fast. So our three-year-old little autistic who just woke up and just got out of that, that toxic fog has missed three years of development. Other three-year-olds around him are developing at the same, uh, at a very fast rate. So he has to run at a double speed to catch up with them, to learn everything he's missed out on, and plus catch up with their pace of development. That is why autistic children do need intensive teaching protocol on top of gaps. Gaps will get rid of the cause of the disorder, the physical cause of the disorder. It will take that fog away from the brain and the brain will clean up and be able to learn. But then we have to help the child to run fast and catch up, learn intensively. When these children grow up, if it wasn't, for example, autism, it was just, let's say, attention deficit disorder or dyslexia, so the child went to mainstream school and seemed to have pulled through, maybe was bullied at school, maybe struggled with maths, maybe struggled with sports, maybe was clumsy, uh, maybe social skills were not so good, it was difficult to make friends for this child. But he sort of managed and uh, everybody made excuses for him and doctors were reluctant to give any diagnostic labels. And then when the children come to teenage years, they want to fit in into social environment. They want to be invited to parties. They want to have friends. They want to have girlfriends and boyfriends. And they would do anything to achieve that. And that is the time when they're very vulnerable for substance abuse. Majority of kids who re react inappropriately to cannabis and to develop and who develop substance abuse, who become drug addicts or alcohol addicts or tobacco addicts or addicts with something else. Uh, there are many addictive behaviors. You can get addicted to various things. The majority, vast majority of these children are gapsters. What happened, and then there are two reasons for that. One is physical, another one is um, emotional. The emotional one is that they want to fit in. And trying drugs or doing their devil reckless things in front of their peers attracts attention and allows them to be popular. And that's the psychological reason why they do that. The physical reason is, I believe that we all born to be happy. How do we reach that level of bliss, of complete joy of life, of happiness, of being on top of the world? By our brain receiving a fountain of neurotransmitters. These are chemicals that the brain uses for its functions. Serotonin, dopamine, epinephrine, GABA, and endorphins, and there are 200 of them also, also <coughs> that have been discovered so far. And the more we research these chemicals, the more we realize that they actually manufactured in the gut. The gut has been called the second brain for a long time. 
because it does pretty much everything the brain does, just on a different level. Apparently, majority of these neurotransmitters are manufactured, produced in the gut, and then they transport it to the brain to be used by the brain. These children grew up with a digestive disorder, with abnormal gut flora. Their gut was in a mess most of their life. So they were not able to produce enough of those neurotransmitters. They were always under power. That is why they went through their childhood being depressed, really, not having enough neurotransmitters to function properly. And they've never experienced that joy of life, that being on top of the world. Cannabis, morphine, heroin, reckless, dangerous behaviors, abusing alcohol, abusing drugs, abusing other things, can provide that fountain for you for a few minutes. And the first time the kid experiences that, uh, that joy of life, they realize that's what life is about. That's what all these happy kids around are about. And they want it again. And of course, we can blame them. And that's where the physical dependency on these addictive substances comes in. They become a drug addict or they become an addict uh, with something else. This are gaps children. So in order to help them, it is the gut we have to start from. We have to heal that. That will take time. And the only children in my experience who recovered from these addictions are the children who had a strong family. Forget about mainstream profession. They do not understand what causes these disorders and they have no idea how to treat them. All they can do is just uh, uh, suppress symptoms and help you to control the situation a little. You have to do it yourself. The children who have a strong family and strong group of friends, what these families did, they basically sectioned the child at home and put him through the diet. This child would have to sleep in the bedroom with some cousin or a couple of cousins or friends who would make sure that the kid doesn't climb out of the window in the middle of the night and go to a 24-hour uh, supermarket and sabotage the diet. Because they mm. do that. They're very yes. crafty. <laughs> They're very skillful. They will sabotage every effort the parents uh, will make to heal them. And they will get chocolate muffins and they'll get sweets and they'll get Coca-Cola and, and the rest of it. So this kid has to, be, uh, has to be monitored and looked after 24 hours a day by mm. uh, a family, a strong family. So the family has to create a rotor now. So many hours you're in charge. Uh, this house is yours, this house is yours, and in the rotation, the family needs to be with him all the time. Mom may be cooking, aunt may be shopping, father may be, uh, you know, doing something else. So the whole family needs to be involved. And these are the kids in my experience and in my clinic who recovered fully and doing great. The same goes for anorexia, for bulimia, for depressed kids, for kids with OCD, for kids with schizophrenia, and with other psychiatric disorders. They can all recover fully. And they can regain normal life, healthy, normal life. But for the first two months at least, they have to have a strong family uh, who can section them at home and put them through that intensive GAPS introduction diet, achieve the maximum healing in their digestive system. And once that river of toxicity from the gut stops and the kid wakes up and he becomes normal, Mm. All the emotional issues disappear, the abnormal behaviors disappear, the unreasonable behaviors disappear. They become intelligent, normal human beings. You can reason with them, you can talk to them. At that point, they start complying because yeah. they realize what happened. They realize that they're being helped. That's when they can start cooking with you and helping you. And that's when the family can relax a little. The cousins can yeah. go back to their lives and <laughs> he can sleep on his own. Um, <laughs> bedroom and uh, these are the only families that were really helped My that's book. interesting that you mentioned that because I know when we had when we started with Isaac I often said to people um, I had him like under my arm pretty much all day long and he was there beside me and um, if he started to scream and cry I'd hold him and he had his family around him all the time and I think that is such a big part of it so I'm really glad you mentioned that and that's the only way to help these people, to, to help these yeah. teenagers and these kids. The only way. Um, mm -hmm. Because what's happening in the mainstream, these children are sectioned in a psychiatric hospital. They put yes. on drugs. Um, and uh, in every psychiatric ward, they have this communal kitchen. And I've been in these kitchens. The fridge is full of soft drinks. Yeah, sugar, it's sugar, just sugar everywhere. Yeah. Breakfast cereals. They eat bread all day long. Yeah. And mm -hmm. with margarine, it's all low fat. It's mm -hmm. terrible. 
So they would never recover there. And they spent a month or two months in the hospital, then they released home um, with lots of drugs. And of course, they haven't recovered. They're just being suppressed. Um, the brain is being suppressed by the drugs, the symptoms are being suppressed. And of course, they will go back and they will relapse uh, soon enough and new drugs will be tried. And that's a slippery slope. Once you're diagnosed with a psychiatric illness, your life is over. It's finished. Okay. It is extremely sad, very, very sad. Yes, these kids in the Western world get a lot of social support and they get money, they don't have to work, uh, but they have no life. Mm. Um, where you as a family, if you have a strong family, you can get rid of that situation. You can get rid of schizophrenia. You can yeah. get rid of OCD. You can get rid of depression or anorexia of epilepsy. I haven't mentioned epilepsy. In a proportion of GAPS people, children and adults, when the brain gets too much toxicity, and this toxicity is particularly malicious, and it is damaging the physical structure of the brain, the brain develops a cleansing procedure, a safety valve. It sends one electric discharge through and clears the whole lot of toxins. It cleans itself up. Wow. And that electric discharge manifests itself as an epileptic seizure. This fact has been known for 200 years, at least, maybe longer, because psychiatrists in the 1800s in textbooks of psychiatry uh, described how psychotic patients, uh, and in those days, these patients had to be locked up in a cage, there was no other way of um, dealing with them, unfortunately, when they were violent and raging. And when this patient in a cage had an epileptic seizure, and again, they could do nothing with it. They just had to allow him to have the seizure to go through it. There was no way of suppressing, stopping it. Hmm. When he comes out of that seizure, this person is normal. Psychosis disappears. It's a normal, reasonable, intelligent human being. You can talk to them. They behave normally. But of course, the gut is still damaged. The gut flora is still abnormal, toxicity is still coming in. So in a few hours, maybe a few days, the toxicity builds up in the brain again and the person would slide back into psychosis. Hmm. But this was described. So it's, it was known in classical psychiatry for hundreds of years that epileptic seizure is a cleansing procedure for the brain. So the last thing these children and adults need is more toxicity added to the brain in the form of anti-epileptic medication. What we need to do, we need to subtract toxins. And by the way, one of the major side effects of anti-epileptic medication is epileptic seizures. Huh. These medications cause epileptic seizures. This is, this is um, toxic. confusing, isn't it? It's, 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 it's mm. terrible, but that's the way it is. So there are dangerous forms of epilepsy when a child has, let's say, 5 to 15 grand mal seizures per day. That can mm. kill a child. That can finish up in a very sad situation. So these children do need uh, medication. So we put them in medication, but then you put them on the GAPS nutritional protocol strictly on the introduction mm -hmm. diet for as long as it takes for the seizures to disappear or to turn into uh, much, much milder, maybe petite mal or absences or something else like that. And then we start removing medication gradually and slowly in these children. We half the dose of medication, maybe for a month. Then we have the remaining dose for a month, then we have the remaining dose, and in that manner, slowly, slowly, we remove the medication. Because all psychotropic medication, including anti-epileptic, is addictive. Mm. You cannot just stop it. You have to remove it gradually, slowly, and very, very carefully. If you try to just stop it, the person will relapse because the person will go into a withdrawal of the medication, which clinically will look very much uh, similar like the disorder itself. So the person will suffer schizophrenia or psychosis or epilepsy or something else. Thankfully, majority of children, more than 70%, are not in the category of the severe <clears throat> patients. They have one epileptic seizure and then they have none months. These children, I believe, should not be put on medication. That's the last thing that should be done. These children should be put on the GAPS nutritional protocol immediately. And hopefully in the majority of these children, if that's done, Another epileptic seizure will never happen. It just will never happen because they will stop that level of toxicity, will heal and seal the gut, the brain will clean itself up, and it will not need to use that safety valve ever again. It will not need to do that ever again. Yeah. So that's what the cause of epilepsy is in children and in adults. So we do the same with adults, even adults who had epilepsy for many, many years and have been on medication for many, many years. Even these people can recover. 
which is don't wow. stop medication we remove it later well, then, Natasha, I'm wondering with, with the GAPS diet, because there's so many diets out there and GAPS is so effective at healing these conditions. How did you come to uh, decide which foods are the ones that will be able to help the gut? Like, it's, it seems like such a, a mammoth task to come to, the, to these foods and to actually decide that these are the ones that will work and these won't work. How did you come to that? And what's the the foundation behind your idea around the foods that you've chosen with the GAPS diet? GAPS diet is, is there are many, many diets uh, out there, a lot of different diets, and they achieve different things. GAPS diet was specifically designed to heal and seal the gut wall and to change the gut flora, normalize the gut flora in the person, to fix the gut, basically. That's what it's been designed uh, for. And it actually comes from my childhood. When I was 18 months old, uh, I contracted uh, cholera or some other microbe, yeah. uh, had a food poisoning. And uh, for eight months, um, I was very ill. I almost died, apparently, as, as a toddler. And uh, at that time, uh, I grew up in the Soviet Union. There were Russians. Um, the foods in the city were very difficult to obtain, quality foods. So my grandparents came from the village and took me to the village. And my grandmother was a village healer. She knew herbs and she knew um, foods and she knew how to heal. She was an extremely intelligent, wonderful lady. And she healed me with soup and sour milk. They had a cow, they had bees, they had a, a large garden, they had a small holding, they had chickens and ducks and geese. They had a small hold in the village. Everybody had small holdings um, in the villages in those days. And she healed me. So next time when my parents came from the city, they were able to come from the city. I was this bouncing, healthy toddler with uh, rosy cheeks. <laughs> and <laughs> that's, awesome. that's where uh, my, my, that's right, that's where my foundation of GAPS uh, diet comes from. Because I grew up with this diet. And my grandmother, that's what she fed us. And that's what she um, taught me. She had this great big tub in her pantry uh, with sour milk, and it wasn't yogurt or kefir, it was their particular formulation. And every household had their own formula, I think, sure. which was amazing. And she fed every day, yeah, fed it every day with fresh milk. As she would milk her cow in the morning, she would top that, top that up, and that, um, that uh, brew went on forever. And it was sure. very, very sour, tasting very, very sour, and, and quite thick, because I remember that. And, um, I loved it as a child. <laughs> so I had lots of that and I had soup, 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 and eggs and meat and cooked vegetables. <laughs> and that's, that's how awesome. I recovered and that's what my grandmother said. And then when my child got ill and I started learning and trying to figure out what to do with him, obviously the first thing I came across was gluten casein free diet. And it just didn't make any sense to me at all. Particularly it was full of processed foods and people were still buying processed foods there which is gluten free and Yes. There were all these companies advertising their biscuits and crackers and breads and <laughs> uh, the, the rest of it. It just didn't make sense to me. And then I went to one conference and Elaine Gottschall spoke at that conference. God bless that lady. She was an mm-hmm. amazing, amazing pioneer, an amazing person. She was a mother. She also healed her little daughter from autism and also chief colitis. And uh, mm-hmm. The diet that she was talking about was SCD, specific carbohydrate diet, that was developed by a group of gastroenterologists in New York in the 30s and 40s. And that diet would have been forgotten if it wasn't for Elaine Gottschall, who um, discovered it, healed her daughter, and then wrote a book about it called Breaking the Vicious Cycle. So I spoke to her and I bought her book immediately and I've implemented that. And I've added all the knowledge I had from my childhood, from what my grandmother was doing. I yeah. made a focus on meat stocks and bone broth, on soup, 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 mm-hmm. and homemade uh, uh, dairy products, uh, sour, sour milk made from raw milk, fresh raw milk, and on fresh and, and on fats, on those sort of things. Mm-hmm. So um, the basis of GAPS diet was the SCD, but then I've altered it and changed it and added the knowledge from my traditional society where I grew up. And that's mm. how um, GAPS diet was born. It's my own patients that called it GAPS diet. Yeah, they created their that's, awesome. that's so good. And as you've gone through the years, um, you've learned more, I suppose, and changed things as you've gone along? 
Yes, absolutely. Gaps diet is evolving. Uh, mm -hmm. The bulk of it is designed. The bulk of it is in my book in uh, Gut and Psychology yeah. Syndrome. That is not going to change because no. that has already helped. I don't know how many people around the world. Uh, we, yeah. we never kept the record how many books were actually sold. Uh, somebody oh, asked really? me the other day how many books were sold around the world because we started our own publishing company and we've never counted. Uh, I have to. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so we don't know how many books actually sold. <laughs> but, uh, approximately, I would say more than a million, certainly. Wow. Um, more than a million. So more than a million people around the world read the book. And I would imagine that there are millions of people that hopefully implemented mm. the protocol and were helped by this protocol. I receive testimonies from people and letters um, and emails from people on a daily basis. Mm. And uh, uh, one day I just decided the world has to see these letters because they're so moving and they're so powerful. Just like your story, Joe. Isaac's story. Yeah. It is so powerful. Yeah. It is so powerful, these stories. They help people to motivate them and they give them hope. In the world yeah, that's where uh, the mainstream tells that's them, they, well, this is incurable. Well, that's, that's what we found, that until we started reading stories of people who'd gotten well and healed from OCD, Isaac had no hope. And when he started hear, hearing that others hadn't gotten well, it was like it flicked a switch in him and he was determined to try and it just changed everything. So it's so important, those stories. Absolutely. A few years ago, um, I have collected uh, 52 such stories from people. Mm -hmm. I contacted all of those people who got their permission and we published those stories as a book. We called it Gaps Stories. It's a powerful book. Please read it. It's available on Amazon. Mm. It's available online. Gaps Stories. And uh, okay. half of the stories are families, uh, children, half of the stories adults. And the list of disorders that people have recovered from is amazing. Chronic mm. fatigue is there. Myalgia, ME, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, schizophrenia, alcoholism, drug addiction, autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, epilepsy, narcolepsy, neuropathies, <clears throat> cystitis, psoriasis, all kinds of things. People recovered fully mm. from all, all of the so-called incurable diseases. They are curable because human body is a miraculous creation. It's yeah. got all the healing programs in. It's your own body that heals itself, not, not the doctor, yeah. not the pill, not the drug, not the medication. Um, it's your own body that does the healing. And with the GAPS nutritional protocol, what we do, we give the body every resource to clean itself and to heal itself. And the body just gets to work and does it. And yeah, all these so so-called so incurable diseases just vanish, disappear. Mm. So good. So, um, Fouad, did you want to ask a question about um, I think you had a question about the changes and things. Yeah, well, I, I was interested um, because we have the uh, online gut health program, which we have over 2,000 subscribers for, and we're constantly working to keep it up to date with uh, your guidelines. And for instance, it was uh, mid last year or so that Elise had come back from doing GAPS training and she said that gelatin was uh, no longer GAPS approved and um, we, we, we use gelatin and we've used it, for instance, in previous re recipes like um, the uh, jellies, like GAPS jellies and things like that. Um, and we still managed to find success and a lot of people continue to heal. And, um, but we continue to try to keep the program up to date with your guidelines. But I'm just wondering with regards to as these guidelines change and they get tweaked, um, what's your opinion on... Um, the um, like the urgency of letting go of the old way and then moving as quickly as you can to the new way. Is there still healing to be found if uh, um, you uh, are still a little bit behind uh, schedule in terms of your knowledge with GAPS or do you always have to stay up to date with it? No, GAPS is <clears throat> set. It's more or less set. And gelatin is allowed on GAPS. Okay. It's just that the recent research has demonstrated that because all the animals in the commercial agriculture are fed genetically modified soya and fed commercial feeds, which are made out of grains and soya, which have been sprayed with glyphosate. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And quite the same, and it's like, uh, it, it, is, it is one of, one of the most appalling and pervasive and harmful agricultural chemicals. And it is yes. the most used chemical right now mm. in the Western agriculture, unfortunately. It's everywhere. It's in every uh, plant that has been grown by industrial agriculture. <clears throat> and of course, all the animals are fed it. They all fed pellets. They all fed commercial foods. That's right. Even and fish. Uh, unfortunately, the... Um, Glyphosate in its biochemical structure is very similar to an amino acid glycine, which is abundant in gelatin, abundant in collagen, and all of these phytomolecules, which are essential to rebuild the gut lining, to heal and seal the gut. They're essential. So um, it is important for us now to look for organic gelatin and look for meats um, that were grown on organic farms and speak to the farmer and ask them, are they feeding pellets? commercial pellets because even on organic mm. farms they still feed these pellets made out of soya and, and grains and who knows there's a lot of cheating in an organic sector Absolutely. I'm afraid to say. Absolutely. Yeah. Cheating. so that is a question however many people ask me do we have to buy organic meat it's expensive do we have to um, um, buy the most expensive this and this the majority of my patients in my clinic were not wealthy they were ordinary yeah. people, and many of them were struggling financially. And they bought meat wherever they could get it, and they bought what they could, and they recovered. Their yeah. children recovered. What we need to understand that animals have a powerful detoxification system in their bodies. We have a powerful detox system with the headquarters in the liver and departments in every cell of the body. It's a system that works 24-7, and it is cleaning, 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 cleaning. It has ways of neutralizing chemicals and uh, toxins and toxic metals and other things that our science hasn't even discovered yet. So if an animal was fed uh, inappropriate foods, their detox system has worked on that, and it would have uh, neutralized a large portion of that. It, it, it's not as harmful to eat a piece of non-organic meat or make soup out of non-organic bones than to eat a carrot that has been directly sprayed. Mm. Vegetables and fruit, I do recommend to get organic because okay. plants do not have the same powerful detox system as animals and birds do. That's right. That's interesting. Meat and milk and eggs, uh, get what you can. Do your best to get the best you can possibly find. And also what we need to, do, to understand is organic farmers are not subsidized by governments. In fact, the governments are causing them a lot of obstacles. They're, they're, they're causing a lot of grief to these farms, mm. uh, while subsidizing the industrial agriculture with all its chemicals and big machines. So uh, the only farms, organic farms, holistic farms, which have the animals and the birds and the plants all in a mixture on the farm, that's the only fi way a farm can survive if it is holistic, if it's got everything on it. Uh, because animals restore the quality of the soil after we uh, grow a crop on the soil. So uh, the only way these farms survive is if they have supportive customers, customers who come to the farm and buy directly from the farm. So find these farms in your lo location. Make friends with this farm, visit the farms, see how the animals are kept, see how everything is growing, and patronize that farm and buy directly from them. Your food will be less expensive and you will be getting quality. And you will be getting meat from an animal that li lived a happy life. Yeah. Had no antibiotics, no steroids, no drugs, was on pasture, on grass, under the sunlight. Happy, healthy life. That's a happy meat. That happiness would go through the meat to your body and to your child's body and make your body happy. Rather than buying a piece of meat from an industrial uh, uh, operation somewhere in a supermarket, these poor animals have never seen sunlight. They grew up in a cafe in a prison, in a confined factory operation, where they stand in their own excrements all of their life. They live a short, miserable life. They've been stuffed full of antibiotics, steroids, and other drugs, because otherwise they simply die. They can't survive without these drugs. Mm -hmm. They're so sick, these animals. And fed inappropriate foods. That's misery. Their meat is made out of misery, out of unhappiness, out of disease. And that's what translates to you, and that's what's being passed to you. So do not buy your meat and eggs and milk in supermarkets. Supermarkets are not good places for buying food at all. Find organic farms. Find people who have allotments and grow their own vegetables. Find those little small holdings, little farmers, little people. Support them. Help them. Buy their produce. Pay them good price for it. And as a result, everybody will win. 
your health will win, your children will feel better, you will feel better, and the farmer will survive. Mm. The environment as well. Um, a quick question on uh, probiotics. And there's a, a huge, huge um, focus in GAPS on fermented foods, things like kefir and sauerkraut. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about the types of bacteria that we can actually eat to repopulate our guts and whether eating just uh, these lactoferments are sufficient or do we need more supplementation like soil-based bacteria or other types of bacteria? Okay. Um, the science only recently started researching our microbiome, our gut flora, that they've renamed it as microbiome. Um, and uh, the more we're researching it, the more we're realizing just how little we know. And the gut is populated not just by bacteria, the biggest and the most uh, fundamental population in there are fungi. At least 70 species of different fungi, molds, and uh, lichens and fungi that were discovered live in a healthy digestive system of a human being. <clears throat> and this fungi, what they do, the gut flora in our digestive systems is akin to soil under our, uh, under our feet. The more we research soil, the more we will know about our gut flora. And the structure of the soil, the soil is a microbial community. And fungi in the soil are absolutely vital. What they do, they grow long hyphae, long, several meters long uh, protrusions. Uh, and these protrusions are about 100 times uh, bigger in size than the bacteria in size. Yeah. So this, this, uh, uh, this system of fungi in the soil is the road work mm. in the soil like the road works in our countries. Is this the mycelium that you're talking about? Sorry. The mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza, okay. Mycorrhiza, that's right. We have our own mycorrhiza in our gut. This mycorrhiza grows long protrusions and it goes right through the biofilm because every microbe in the gut produces little excretions made out of proteins and fats and carbohydrates, making their own little home. Nobody can live out there in the open. You know, when you move somewhere, you want a home, don't you? So bacteria and viruses and protozoa and, and other creatures in the gut do the same. They produce these little substances, these proteins and other things, and they create a little home for themselves, little walls and windows and doors and furniture and, <laughs> and the rest of it. So, and, and that home, uh, all mixed up, you know, because every bacteria, every little microbe sitting there, they all produce their own little homes. And these substances mix together. And what they form is this layer of uh, mixed proteins and carbohydrates and fats called biofilm. So they live in this biofilm. Through that thick layer of biofilm, which coats the whole length of your digestive system, starting from your lips all the way to the very end, this whole layer of biofilm is cut right through by this uh, mycorrhiza, by this fungal uh, protrusions, fun fungal growth. And this is the road work in that biofilm, in our soil inside us. These are the motorways and roads and streets and lanes and, and cul-de-sacs. And along the sides of those roads, bacteria make their little homes. And food and water is delivered along that road work to these bacteria and to viruses and to protozoa and other creatures in the gut flora. And excrements are removed and water is delivered. And information is passed throughout the gut flora through this network, fungal network. So fungi are absolutely fundamental in our gut flora. They're very, very important. And our science hasn't even started researching them properly yet. Mm -hmm. They haven't even looked at that. So far, they've been focused on bacteria, 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 and more bacteria. <laughs> they think that that's the only yeah. thing that they look the gut flora. Mm -hmm. Viruses are very important. They're absolutely vital. They also live along that road work with their own little homes and they interact with bacteria. Protozoa are large creatures. They eat fungi, they eat bacteria, they eat viruses, and they crawl about uh, in that biofilm. And they're like elephants in there. And, and they, they create their own, uh, in, they do uh, their own important functions in there. And then we have larger creatures, flukes and worms, and uh, things that we call parasites. They're also important. And they're also an important part of our gut flora. All of those things are vital. All of those things are important. When we ferment food at home, the natural way, without adding any culture, just uh, by adding salt, the sauerkraut method of fermentation, or we ferment milk, 
by adding kefir, for example, or we do kombucha or water kefir, uh, we do uh, or any other, other natural way. The kefir culture has more than 200 of different microbes in it, and the basis of it are fungi. Again, it has viruses in it, and it has bacteria in it, and it has fungi in it. It is a, 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 a balanced community of all of these different creatures. So it is much better to do that and much cheaper to do that at home, to make kefir every day and consume it uh, than buying a commercial probiotic. Mm. Much less expensive and you will provide a much more varied and balanced community of microbes for your digestive system and also in a food form. When they come in, uh, if you do have a normal stomach acid production, these microbes are hidden inside the particles of food. They're protected. So that food particle will carry those, that microbial community all the way throughout your digestive system, all the way to the end. None of it will be damaged anywhere. Are, are yeah. all the bacteria or do these ferments provide all these missing bacteria or the ones that are in low populations? Or for instance, if someone is born and they've taken courses of antibiotics and their gut flora is really severely impeded, they, they don't have the strains that they need. Um, when they start eating these more like wild ferments that you're making at home, and rather than just buying uh, just a few types of or a few strains of bacteria in pill form or powder form, is this sufficient? Is is that a, like will, for instance, a wild fermented sauerkraut plus kefir plus kombucha um, plus yogurt? Would they provide all the necessary bacteria to repopulate the gut, or will we still be missing some vital ones that we might need to supplement with? Or how, what's your view on that in particular? Every fermented food, every batch provides its own microbial community. It's unique. Mm. It depends on where the cabbage was grown or the carrots or the beetroot or whatever vegetable. What soil composition uh, did you have? What weather was uh, on that, in that particular season? Um, so the, the composition of the cabbage will provide different nutrient content and as a result, different microbes will grow in it. So every batch of sauerkraut is different and will provide a different microbial community. The same with kefir. Despite the fact that you're putting kefir grains in there, and they have a, a, a microbial community, depending on what food is presented to them, what the cow has eaten on that particular day, <laughs> what quality yeah. of grass she was consuming. Was it a sunny day or was it a gloomy day? Um, you know, it, it again will alter the quality of the milk and the composition of the milk. And it is mm. the nutrients that we present microbes with that will... Uh, predetermine what community of microbes you'll be consuming in that fermented food. By changing the substrate, by changing what we feed them, we can alter certain, certain microbes will reduce in numbers, other microbes will flourish. So every fermented food has a different composition, uh, microbial composition, and they mm. need to be an important part of our diet. They used to be an important part of human diet for millennia. Yes. Because for millennia, we didn't have refrigeration. Um, yeah. One of the supermarkets, we can buy anything out of season. Um, when your cabbages were ripe in September, you have to do something with them, otherwise they will rot away and you'll be left without cabbage for the rest of the year. So people mm. ferment everything. They fermented milk and vegetables and fruit and beans and grains and meat and fish. So every day, pretty much at every meal, they would eat something fermented. So they yes. supplemented their diet with probiotic microbes all the time for breakfast, lunch and dinner for thousands of years. And only in the last hundred years we stopped doing that because our food industry appeared on the planet and changed all our recipes and chased women out of the kitchen. And yeah. this, this You're bringing up so many things I want to ask you. <laughs> but let me finish with the probiotics okay, first. Yes, go ahead. Uh, the commercial probiotics have a place, without doubt, and there are very good uh, commercial probiotics on the market. There are some very, very good brands, and I do use them in my clinic. But it is important to work with a practitioner with these probiotics. Mm. Because the practitioner would know at what point to use a commercial probiotic for you and at what point you can stop taking it and just go on with the fermented foods. For some patients, particularly in the initial stages when we're trying to overcome some particularly severe situation or we're trying to control a die-off reaction in a person, which can be very, very severe in some people, it is useful to use commercial probiotics. But work with a practitioner. Commercial probiotics are expensive. Majority of people can't afford to keep taking them for the rest of their lives. Mm. It is much less expensive to make sauerkraut or kimchi yes. or, or, or kefir, you know, or kombucha, because once you've got those little kefir grains, they grow and grow and grow, and you can share them with your friends and family, and it costs you nothing. Just keep them feeding every day, keep them fed every day with fresh milk. 
That's all. And they will carry your health for the rest of your life. So people need to understand that fermented foods are not optional for human mm. beings. It's a must. Yeah. Your children, your babies, all of you must have them on a daily basis. And what I do, um, whatever vegetables have grown in my garden, I'm a farmer. I have been a farmer for the last five years. We bought a farm, 28 That's acres. Cool. We have everything. We have a milking cow. We have two milking goats. We have pigs and chickens and goats and ducks and gardens. <laughs> <laughs> and orchards. So we produce our own food. And uh, what I recommend, if, for example, you have a big batch of radishes, and there's so many of them, and they ripen. And if you don't harvest, if you don't harvest them right now, they will overgrow, become tough, and no good for anybody. And your family can't eat so many radishes right now. <laughs> there's only so many radishes you can eat on a daily basis. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Pickle them. Make a brine, salty brine. Put them in a, a large jar. Add some uh, spices there, some salt and uh, some pepper, and some uh, juniper berries maybe. Put a leaf of horseradish on top on every of your uh, vegetables, every fermented vegetables, when you packed it in a jar, put a leaf of horseradish on top. It will stop molds from growing on the top. Oh, that's interesting. Your ferment. So I, I grow horseradish in my garden. It produces these great big um, leaves, beautiful leaves. And you just break one leaf fresh and you put it on top. Make sure the whole thing is submerged in the brine. And you will have these radishes. And uh, in winter, what I do, I, I, I pickle all of my excess uh, vegetables. For example, if I have lots of celery, I do a pickled celery like that, fermented celery, or I have parsley. I do that with parsley, chop it up. and, mm. and then You wouldn't eat those uh, ferments on their own because they're a bit bitter. They may not taste fantastic. But if you add a handful into every soup, every stew, every uh, vegetable that you, vegetables that you cook and, and meat that you cook, at the beginning of cooking, these vegetables are pre-digested and the beneficial microbes that they carry will work even when they're dead. That hmm. is amazing, an amazing fact. Even when they're dead, yeah. when they're cooked, subjected to heat for several hours, they still work in the digestive system. They still do a lot of good uh, functions for us. And if you add a handful of your fermented celery to your stew at the beginning, it will give lovely acidity to the stew. And if you then uh, added it maybe a couple of hours before you put it in the oven or put it on heat, the meat will be slightly fermented. It's important to ferment our meat, particularly pork. Pork needs to be fermented before we cook it for a couple of hours at least, preferably mm. overnight. So if you mix your pork with these fermented vegetables, a handful of your fermented radishes or chop them up in a food processor into a mush and mix them with the meat and leave it to ferment, to, to, to marinate overnight. And then next morning you put it on and you, you cook it. And your meat will be fermented and pre-digested slightly and cleaned. This bacteria will neutralize whatever toxins there might be in the meat. Oh, that's interesting. Them and they will pre-digest the meat, and that meat will be much easier to digest. And mm. add them to your soups, and you cook these ferments. You can cook them. And uh, that way you'll be consuming them for every meal. That's awesome. That's very new to me, this idea that you can actually uh, cook uh, fermented foods and still get the benefit of the bacteria, even though... I, I was on the assumption that once the bacteria is dead, that that's it. Like you, you won't get the benefit from it. You just get the beautiful flavor. And it makes me excited because I really love German sauerkraut and I love it hot. <laughs> and, and I've been eating cold sauerkraut for the past few years thinking that, I'm, you know, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that <laughs> I have. Germans cook their sauerkraut. Germans right. cook sauerkraut. Yeah, I love it that way. That's right. And, and yeah, they have it hot. Their sausages and cooked sauerkraut is a standard deal. Yes, <laughs> beautiful. I can have that again. I'm excited now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, the microbes, these, these beneficial microbes, they have substances in their skin called chelators, which grab hold of mercury and lead and aluminium and other toxic metals mm. and will hold them until they take them out of your system. And mm. these substances do not get neutralized by cooking. They're still there. So by cooking your sauerkraut with your stew, with your meat, or cooking your fermented radishes, or your fermented celery, or fermented parsley, or fermented carrot, or fermented beetroot. Fermented beetroot is great in soups, or mm. great with in stew. would be. With yeah. meat. Fantastic. And uh, you'll be removing toxic metals out of your body in a powerful huh. way. Wow. That's so good to know. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question about kombucha? Um, so that's 
like you recommend that that's fine on intro now as long as it's fermented for three weeks, I think you say? Yes, and I make my kombucha with honey. Okay, yep. It works perfectly well with honey. Oh, beautiful. And just if you just have a regular scoby that someone's given you, you can make it with honey and it'll be fine? Absolutely, and that way you don't have to ferment it to the point of tasting like vinegar. Right. Um, you can have it slightly sweeter because it is honey you have in, and honey oh, is allowed on the gas. That's machine. good. It's allowed what because I it's pre-digested. Is that the, the idea that the fact that it's been pre-digested by the bees so it's um, easy to digest compared to like uh, coconut sugar or something? I wouldn't use any sugars at all okay. which were produced by food industry mm. because honey is a whole product made by nature. Mm -hmm. It doesn't yeah. just have the sugars in it. It has a, a myriad of other substances which balance those sugars out. And they come as a complex into the body and the body knows what to do with those sugars because all the core factors and other elements are there to deal mm. with that sugar, to assist the body in dealing with that sugar. When we take a whole product from nature like sugar beet or sugar cane or coconut or agave or, 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 or anything else and we extract the sugar out of it and throw everything else away, mm. it is unbalanced sugar. It is a, a synthetic product. It is Yes, it came from a natural source, but it, it's not balanced anymore for all those other nutrients that were in the sugar beet, were mm. in the sugar cane, were in the um, uh, coconut, and were in the agave itself. And they are necessary. Everything nature put into every food is necessary. Don't think we are cleverer than nature. Our food industry is <laughs> that they are. They're not. How does you can't remove things out of a natural product and think that that is good for you. It is not. Because it's a natural and butter, for instance, these, um, these are sort of um, the condensed form of the fat from milk. Uh, how come that f uh, way of thinking doesn't apply to those? It doesn't uh, because that is, that is uh, made naturally. And of course, we don't have butter on its own. We have other things with it. We okay. have vegetables and other things with it. Okay. But generally speaking, what we need to keep in mind that the more <clears throat> natural and whole the food is, the better it is for us, the more balanced it is. Okay. Look, can I just... I, I explained this in my books, um, in my heart book, I've explained it in Putting Heart in Your Mouth, and in other books, in Vegetarian Book, I have explained it, that um, in order for the human body to metabolize one molecule of table sugar, it needs 56 molecules of uh, magnesium. It needs wow. so many molecules of zinc, it needs chromium, it needs amino acids, it needs enzymes, and it needs other substances. Yes. When we take a piece of sugar beet into a laboratory and analyze it, we find that indeed every molecule of sugar in a piece of fresh sugar beet is accompanied by all of those molecules, all yes. of those 56 molecules of magnesium and those molecules of wow. zinc and chromium. And That's the rest. Exactly. And when, it, when we eat a piece of uh, sugar beet, uh, raw and fresh, then that sugar in the sugar beet digests beautifully in the body and does us only good because it came in holding hands with all those other nutrients which yes. are necessary yeah. for the body yes. to utilize it. But what do we do in our big factories? We take the sugar out and we throw everything else away. Mm -hmm. so that sugar comes into your body like a villain, like a high yeah. <laughs> It needs those 56 molecules of magnesium. Where is that magnesium going to come from? Hmm. From your muscles, from your yeah. bones. Yeah. causing osteoporosis, causing muscle cramps, causing high blood pressure. Yeah. In order to contract, your blood vessels need magnesium. In order to, uh, uh, to uh, calcium, in order to relax, they need magnesium. And if all the magnesium in the body is bound uh, in digesting the sugar that you've eaten, then your blood vessels can't relax and your blood pressure goes up. Or you just start scraping off the wall. Um, so... Sugar is one of the most harmful things you can put into your mouth. And it doesn't matter what it's made from, what it's been extracted from. Mm -hmm. Whether it's been extracted from coconut, from sugar cane, from sugar beet, from beetroot, from agave uh, plant, or from anything else. Mm -hmm. all a holistic, and, and honey is a whole product. Bees yeah. made it, nature made it. So can you give us a ratio for making the kombucha with honey sorry i've just had people ask about this before <laughs> um what's your ratio of tea and water and honey i'm not very scientific okay <laughs> i just you know add whatever you know uh, uh, looks good to me and i taste it if it tastes sweet then my kombucha <laughs> is happy <laughs> and so you I don't 
Yes, okay. I don't measure anything. But okay. what, what, I, what I do, uh, we have a lot of berries on our farm. We have logan berries and blackberries. Our freezers mm -hmm. are full. So we, I, make, I make what I call compote, where I put a pan of berries into the pan, top it up with water, bring it up to boil, and then let it cool down, strain it. And that beautiful red liquid, then when it's cooled down, I add honey to taste. So it tastes mm -hmm. nice. And then into that liquid, I plop my kombucha. Right. And it works on that, uh, and uh, it turns it into a beautiful fizzy drink. And Sounds usually, amazing. <laughs> absolutely. A couple of hours is enough. So I keep my scoby in a separate jug, and I keep topping it up with uh, this compote that I call. Mm -hmm. And what I do when I've made the compote, the, the jug of compote is just this red liquid with honey. I maybe add half a cup of that kombucha liquid from the other jug. I don't drink okay. it neat. Uh, because yeah. my family finds it a bit too, too acid, too sour, you yeah. know, too taste. But if you just add a little bit into that uh, cordial that you made, that compote you made, the family will love it and it will be fizzy and beautiful and not too sour. Sounds great. And when would people be able to start that on intro? I usually recommend it from starting from second or third uh, stages. Okay. Your body yeah. will let you know. If you introduced it and something happened uh, not so good, too soon, yeah. I can't be ready too soon. Just wait a little. Okay. And different people are different. There's yes. a lot of fear in us when we when we do gaps that we're doing things wrong and that we yeah. we're kind of uh, adding something too early and that we're gonna mess our bodies up and we're gonna really um, delay healing or cause. Well, we're gonna have to start over. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's a common fear for, for those of us who have tried GAPS. Can you give us a word of encouragement around that, perhaps? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We all, you know, life is a, is a, is a learning curve, I think. It's, it's sometimes very, very steep. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to go through that. Sometimes it's more relaxed. Sometimes it's an Everest, without doubt. Um, so uh, when you've been on the first stage for a few days, you move to the second stage. And on the first stage, your major symptoms will start disappearing. Diarrhea disappears, pain disappears in the digestive system. Eye contact starts uh, uh, normalizing in the child. Uh, various uh, skimming in, in an autistic child start disappearing. So in, a very, in, very, in every person, it's an individual group of symptoms. You will see them. Keep a diary. This really, it's really invaluable. I know it's a bit of a discipline, and I know it takes uh, uh, a few minutes per day from you but it is a good idea to keep a diary just keep jotting things into the diary uh, what's yeah. happening because then you could look back and realize where you've uh, gone astray and when you move to the second stage let's say or third stage and some of these symptoms that disappeared on the previous stage start creeping back in that's an indication for you too early you're not ready mm. go back yeah. it's always disappointing Go back and uh, stay another week, stay another couple of weeks, then try again. So it's a dance. A step forward, a step back, a step forward. Yes. Step back. <laughs> and then one day you would step forward after several dances. <laughs> and <laughs> then it's fantastic. There's no regression. The symptom mm -hmm. didn't come back. And that's the day when you got healed enough to yes. be tolerating those new foods that you're introducing. Mm -hmm. So it is very individual. Some people, uh, you know, uh, go through the introduction diet very quickly uh, mm -hmm. because of a mild condition. Other people dance and dance for a year, sometimes a year and a half. It takes mm -hmm. time. Yeah. yeah. What I would yeah. like to mention uh, uh, also before we, before we uh, move on, uh, yes. we talk about gaps today, but in my clinic I had many anorexic girls. I had a couple of boys okay. too with anorexia, yes. but largely girls. And what I discovered that vast majority of these youngsters became anorexic because of misguided vegetarianism. Huh. They have adopted that lifestyle. And that rang a lot of alarm bells in my, uh, in my mind. So I um, created another learning curve for myself. I've researched that area thoroughly. And the result of that is my new book called Vegetarianism Explained. Yes, I keep meaning, to, I need to read that book. I've heard so much about it. Yes, it is my original research. You will not find that information anywhere else in the world, okay. mm. online or in, in, in any other book, uh, because it is based on my clinical research, on my clinical discoveries, what I've discovered with these patients. And okay. uh, please read it. And if you know anybody who is considering a plant-based lifestyle, please give them that book to read first yeah. before they launch mm. on that 
pathway. There's a lot of misinformation in this world and propaganda yes, for vegetarianism is. is very widely spread and it's becoming more and more intense. And I'm yeah. telling you that this propaganda is coming from the industrial agrochemical complex. Mm -hmm. Because it is easy peasy for them to grow soya, grain, vegetables, plant matter. Because yeah. our agronomists and our uh, agricultural science have spent decades in working out the schemes on how to grow, how to get the yield out of those fields. And these farmers are prescribed. It's actually prescribed. Now, on day one, you spray this. On day five, you spray this chemical. On day 14, you spray that chemical. And here's a machine mm. for this, and here's a machine for that. And here are the seeds for you which have been already pre-treated with this chemical. Yeah. And it works. It works. It produces the yield for them. Huge yield. Mm -hmm. So it, it is profitable and it is easy for them to do. So growing plants for an industrial agriculture is easy. Mm -hmm. While producing meat, milk, uh, and, and other animal foods is very, very hard for them. Very costly, very expensive, very unpleasant, and it's a cruel, cruel practice. That is why our uh, agrochemical complex, our industrial agriculture, would love the majority of the population of the planet should become vegetarians. Mm. Because that, the profit for them will be through the skies. Oh, yeah. That's where this propaganda is coming from. When we look at the organic agriculture, these two things swap entirely. Keeping animals is easy and fun and lovely. You feed them in the morning, you let them out. You feed them in the evening, you lock them up. But That's it's necessary the as well. Not only that, it's needed for absolutely, a farm. Absolutely. absolutely. While growing plants on an organic farm is a nightmare. It is very, very, very hard. Yeah. Based on that, uh, because of the weather, because of the uh, pests, because of birds, because of rabbits, because of deer and, and a myriad of other different things, it rains at the wrong time, it's hot at the wrong time, and your yield just fails. And you mm. don't know why. Because you can't use chemicals. You can't cut corners. You have to do it the natural way. It is simply not possible to feed even one vegetarian for a year out of a, a private organic garden. <laughs> the vast majority of these vegans and vegetarians buy their food from supermarkets. Where is all yeah. that water coming from? From industrial arable agriculture, which is destroying topsoil, which is causing global warming, which is polluting our waters, and which is destroying the wildlife. There is nothing kind to the planet, kind to animals, or life-saving or healthy about a vegetarian lifestyle because you're becoming a, a, an activist for the destruction of the planet because you're giving the profits to the uh, arable industrial agriculture. That's where your food comes from. Please read my book. I haven't got time to talk about yeah. it in detail now. Yeah. I'll explain all the ins and outs. Too. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned it because I did have it on my list. I do have one, one just follow-up question on that. If we just have a few minutes on, on just that topic. Because um, the argument isn't only that it's healthier to not eat meat, it's that it's our natural way as human beings is to be vegetarians. And to me, that's completely ridiculous, that, uh, that idea. I would like to un see your take on it. Like, how do you see us as omnivorous human beings? Or what's, what's the, how could an argument like we are, should be vegetarians, how could that even stand? <laughs> well, <laughs> my first chapter deals with that issue um, comprehensively. Okay. Um, okay. What we need to understand that all energy on our beautiful planet is recycled. New energy comes from the sun, as far as we know uh, so far. In order for something in the nature to capture that sunlight and turn it into physical matter that we can touch and eat, Mother Nature creates plants. And in order to capture the sunlight, uh, Mother Nature gave them photosynthesis. They grab hold of sunlight and they convert it into green matter that somebody can eat. In order then for something else to eat the sunlight in the form of plants, Mother Nature created herbivorous animals. And in order for them to be able to digest the plants, Mother Nature equipped them with a very special digestive system called rumen. Because the fact, the scientific fact is, nothing on this planet can digest plants apart from microbes. Nothing, no other creature on the planet is able to break down plant matter and digest it properly apart from microbes. And that's the mechanism that Mother Nature used. A cow has a four chamber, huge stomach called a rumen, full of microbes. It is a rich microbial community. When she swallows a mouthful of grass, that's where it goes. And these microbes digest it for her. 
they break it down, they cleave off uh, um, proteins and minerals and vitamins and the rest of it. And interestingly, 70% uh, of all the sugars in the grass are converted into short-chain fatty acids, which are fully saturated fatty acids. Mm -hmm. And in that form, the cow absorbs them. So herbivorous animals actually live on a very high fat diet. Mm -hmm. That's the form they absorb their grass in. In order then for something else to benefit from the sunlight in the form of herbivorous animals, Mother Nature created the next tier of creatures on the planet, predators and omnivores. That's the group where we belong. We do not have a rumen. We have a, a very small stomach, and if that stomach is healthy, it has virtually no microbial population in it because it produces hydrochloric acid. And the pH before meals when we're hungry can go below one in a healthy stomach. That's an extremely hostile environment for any microbe. The only things that a human stomach is fit for digesting and breaking down properly are meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. It cannot break. That's what hydrochloric acid breaks apart, and that's what pepsin breaks apart, and other ferments uh, 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 that uh, uh, the human stomach manufactures. So these are the only foods that really get digested in the stomach. Plants just sit there and wait for their turn. They do not get digested to any large degree in a human stomach. Wow, then when this mixture moves into your intestine, that's where the absorption happens. That's where the food gets absorbed in the human body. And the only things your intestines can absorb are the things that have been properly broken down, digested properly. So the only things that really properly absorb in our several meters of intestines are meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. Plants only contribute a few minerals, a few vitamins, uh, and cleansing substances. Phytonutrients, salicylates, phenols, antioxidants, and other cleansing substances. But if you look at the bulk of the human body, your heavy bones, your heavy muscles, your big heavy brain, your heavy heart, your lungs, 70% of them is water. When we subtract water, the remaining dry weight is 50-50 protein and fat. In order, in order to build your physical structure in the body, these are the foods we need, protein and fat. And when we analyze the uh, composition of human protein, it is very similar in its amino acid composition to the proteins in meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. The amino acid composition is the same, pretty much. So these foods provide us with a ready-made mixture of amino acids to build our own proteins to build our own physical structure in the body. The same goes about fats. The fat, the 50% of dry weight of you is fat. Fat is a structural element. And when we analyze the biochemical structure of that fat, it is very similar to lamb fat, beef fat, pork fat, chicken fat, and, uh, and butter and cream. And these are the foods that provide us with ready-made building blocks to build your own structural fat in your body. When we look at the plants, they are full of protein, but those proteins are completely inappropriate for human physiology. Their amino acid composition is wrong. Many amino acids are missing, other amino acids are in excess. On top of that, these proteins are indigestible for the human digestive system. Gluten is the most researched plant protein. Look how much damage that's doing to humanity. Gluten, stercolin, and, and, and other proteins like that. The same with fats. When we look at the fats which uh, plants have, vegetable oils that plants have, their biochemical structure is inappropriate for the human physiology, for the structure of your body. They have too many of certain fatty acids, not enough of other fatty acids. We need them in tiny amounts. And when you eat a salad or you eat a handful of nuts, you'll get enough of those oils for that day uh, for your body to supplement itself. The bulk of your fat consumption has to come from animal fats. But what you also need to understand is that human body renews itself all the time. All cells in the body live a short life. They get old, they get worn out, they die, they get shed off, and they're replaced by newly born baby cells. In order to give birth to those trillions of cells on a daily basis, building materials are required. Your body has to make them from something. The right quality protein and the right quality fat and water has to be provided. And the only foods that can feed that cell regeneration process, essential process for us to heal, to rejuvenate ourselves, come from meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. These are the only foods that feed. So these are the feeding, building foods for the human body. So what are the plants for? Plants cannot feed your body to any large degree. 
They do not build your physical structure. But what they do, they keep our bodies clean on the inside. They are cleansers. Mm -hmm. That is their purpose in nature. And when they finally land in your bowel, that's the equivalent of rumen in our in us human beings, because that's where the bulk of our um, uh, gut flora is. That bulk of gut flora can work a little bit on the fiber, on, on the plant, and uh, convert some sugars into short-chain fatty acids, those saturated fats that the same way as it happens in the rumen of the cow, and uh, release some vitamins and things. But the problem is, our rumen is at the end of our digestive system. Mm -hmm. It's too late for the bulk absorption of nutrients. All the absorption already happened higher up. Where in the cow mm -hmm. and in the giraffe and in the antelope and other herbivorous animals, their rumen is at the beginning of their digestive system. That is why they are so well suited to digesting plant matter. They can thrive on it. We human beings cannot thrive on plant matter. So veganism, where a person decides not to eat any animal foods at all, is not a diet. It is a form of fasting. You are cleansing your uh, body. You are cleansing, yes. cleansing, 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 cleansing. It's a good idea to have periods of cleansing. If you're particularly polluted and toxic, you know, a couple of weeks of cleansing on a vegan fast, great. But at a certain point, your body will give you a signal. I finished cleansing. I'm hungry now. Feed me. The way it will tell you that, it will ask you, it will give you a desire for steak, for a cup of cream, for a piece of high-fat cheese or, or eggs or something else like that. And that's the moment that you need to listen to your body and you need to introduce those foods because your body knows what it's doing at every moment. It is infinitely clever. Problem is our vegans, are, majority of them are doing it for emotional reasons, political reasons, religious reasons. They override that signal. <coughs> they don't listen to their body. <coughs> uh, yeah. Joe, you got any more questions? We're going <laughs> over time. And we are over time, but I, I just have a couple of burning questions that maybe we could finish on. Um, one thing is I just want to touch on um, when you were in Australia last time for the Mind Forum, um, you spoke about... Um, a woman's um, job of nourishing and nurturing her family. And one lady in, in our gut health program commented on that and said um, that seeing you speak at the Mind Forum was a game changer for her. And she said she cried when she realised she didn't have to hate her kitchen and she could actually think of nourishing her family as a blessing, not a chore. Um, I wonder if you could just just quickly give our... Uh, mums out there a bit of encouragement because I know a lot of them are doing it really tough and it's hard for them to be in the kitchen working all day and, and it just a reminder for them of what they're really doing. What we need to understand that cooking is power. Huge <laughs> yes. power. Because, and I've learned this from my grandmother, my wonderful grandmother who lived in a traditional society, so I grew up in a more or less traditional society i caught up you know caught one of those uh, dying traditional societies just in time <laughs> and uh, <laughs> women, in this, women in this societies knew that uh, through food they look after the health of their families that yes. the only way to maintain the health of your family is by feeding your family properly and that's a huge power mm. women would never relinquish that power and pass it to anyone else in the family they, mm -hmm. felt they held that power firmly in their hands. And they had knowledge, these women, and that knowledge was passed through generations. Grandmothers will teach their granddaughters, mothers will teach their daughters what to feed a pregnant woman, what to feed a sick child, what mm -hmm. to do in this situation and that situation, what to give to an elderly person who is ailing, what to give to a warrior who got wounded uh, in, a, in, a, in a battle, what herbs to use. Women knew herbs, and my grandmother knew herbs. I remember we used to walk together and she will show me this and show me that and explain to me what to collect, at what time of day to collect, how to prepare and what it would do in the body. Women had all that knowledge. Problem mm -hmm. is in the last hundred years, the food industry has appeared on the planet and they lured, seduced women out of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They pronounced cooking as something dirty and that you dearly don't want to do that, put your feet up, we'll do it all for you. And these skills got lost in the Western world. Women forgot all that knowledge. It got lost through generations. And uh, today, women are even proud that they're not cooking. They kind of jokingly boast to each other that she doesn't yeah. cook. And she yeah. 
cook. That is the most shameful thing a woman can possibly say about herself. What she's doing, basically, she is committing a slow assassination to her family because mm. she has relinquished the God-given power that she was supposed to hold in her hands, to hold the health of her family in her hands, <laughs> after her loved ones through food. She has given that away to mm. a commercial power who's only interested in profit, who has no idea of looking after the health of her family. That's not even there uh, uh, on the agenda for them. Yeah. Women must reclaim that power. They must go back to the kitchens. They must learn to cook. If they want to have healthy children and healthy families. If they don't care, then go ahead. Mm. And obviously, dads can be part of that as well. Fuad's an amazing cook. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. But generally yeah. speaking, you know, um, uh, men and women are different. Mm. <laughs> no matter how much we don't like that fact, they are. They're different. <laughs> And they have a different, uh, different purpose in nature. Nature has given us different purposes. Men, uh, uh, their purpose is to discover new fields and new areas, uh, new endeavors, and to burst into uh, sort of new areas of life and, and to fight for um, this kind of new areas. Where women's uh, purpose in life is nurture yeah. and, and repair. Because women give birth to children. Men can't do that. And in order to have children and bring them up, we need peace. Men are very good at making war. <laughs> creating disasters and havoc in the world because of their nature, because of the way they're designed uh, by, by Mother Nature. Women, they deal with children, they deal with family. They need peace. So it is in a woman's nature to be nurturing, to be healing, to be a healer, to be a nurturer. And the main and the most powerful medicine in the world is food. Food, food, yeah. food. And that is what women need to take back into their hands. If women delegated that vital function of their own to some commercial food industry, why are we surprised that our families are sick and getting yeah. sick with every generation? Yes. Yeah. I, I love the picture of um, your grandmother being the healer of the family and teaching you that. And that's what that's what we want to be for our children. Absolutely. That is the wisdom. That is yeah. real wisdom. And the mainstream will tell you, oh, food has nothing to do with health. Your doctor, yeah. your doctor will tell you that. That, yeah. is, um, that is another agenda and a conversation for another time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, another question from a mum who is a very good friend of ours. Um, she, she said, you know, one thing that women worry about with not just with gaps, but with anything is their weight. And I know that you don't advocate stressing over your weight and just work on the healing um, and learn to accept your body as it is. Um, what would you say to women who have gone through childbirth a few times and they feel like they just can't let go of the weight and they're trying to heal their body and trying to be healthy, but at the same time they would like to lose a bit of that weight? Is there any um, advice that you have for them? There is a mainstream simplistic idea that fat makes you fat. That could not be more wrong. Yeah. Dietary fat does not make you fat. It goes into the structure of your body because every organ inside your cavity is sitting in a, a bed of hard fat. Your heart, your kidneys, your liver, your spleen, your intestines are hanging on, sitting in, in beds of thick layers of fat. The fat is a structural element of your body. So eating fat, you're restoring that structure. That's what you're feeding. You're not putting weight on. If you people usually majority of people on the GAPS nutritional protocol, people who were overweight lose fat. They mm -hmm. become they, they assume a normal body shape. People who were underweight, when they start me. digesting <laughs> their food properly, yes, uh, that might take a few years. When they start yeah. digesting and absorbing their food properly, when the gut heals enough, they start putting weight on and they build their body. Uh, they reach them to not uh, lose uh, uh, weight, not only mm -hmm. women, but men as well. First of all, have yeah. low thyroid function. Secondly, we need to understand that under skin fat is a storage site for toxins in the body. And if your body throughout your lifetime has accumulated particularly uh, toxic things, toxic poisons, and they are nicely imprisoned, tucked away in all that fat on your thighs, and on your belly and on your back, the body needs to prepare to face that before it will allow that fat to be dissolved. Mm. 
So your right. body makes a decision. No, I'm going to, that's not, not my priority number one. My priority number one right now is schizophrenia, OCD, healing the gut, restoring the liver, restoring the heart, restoring the brain, right? So that fat can wait for a while, maybe three years, maybe four years, maybe five years. When right. the body dealt with all the more important priorities, it will come to the point when it says, right, now I'm strong enough. I've got enough resources to face that river of toxins that is going to be released mm. from that fat when I start dissolving it, when mm. the person starts losing it. So your body needs to be ready for that. Your liver has to be ready for that. It has to have all the tools mm. in a row, lined up, ready to face all the toxic metals, all the phenols, all the uh, formaldehyde and whatever else you stored, all your makeup, all your shampoos, all your dyes mm. for your hair. And other things you've been applying to your body, which got stored in your underskin fat. Hmm. Your body has to be ready for that. So just be patient with yourself. It will happen yeah. one day. Continue healing. When you've healed, when you've recovered from diabetes, you've recovered from chronic fatigue, you've recovered from rheumatoid arthritis, you've recovered from multiple sclerosis, you've recovered from mental illness, then your body will decide, right, now I can face that priority. Yes. That's very good. For I don't know if you've got time for any more questions. It's just gone too quickly. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there is, uh, there is one um, lady, there was actually a couple of them that are pregnant and finding it a real struggle to eat GAPS food because they're craving carbohydrates and um, wanting to stay healthy during pregnancy but feeling so sick. Um, have you got any advice on that? In my vegetarian book, please read it, there is mm -hmm. a chapter... Um, one month's meat is another month's poison. It will answer yeah. that question for you very well. Okay, perfect. Um, because uh, I have touched on it. Um, human body at every moment is busy doing something. And yeah. uh, we change. Every minute, our very many parameters and checks and balances in our body change. The homeostasis yes. changes. The balance of your parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous system changes. The electrolyte balance, the hormones, the neurotransmitters, the, the myriad of things that change. And every metabolic state requires certain food to be sustained, to be fed. And uh, these requirements change throughout the life. And during pregnancy, these requirements definitely change. Your body will keep you sending you signals, what it needs at any particular moment. The way your body tells it uh, is very simple. It gives you a desire for particular foods. Mm. You need to listen to that. To that yeah. desire, because your body knows the composition of foods on this planet. Make no mistake, your body has that information programmed into it. It knows yeah. the composition of apples. It knows the composition of meat. So you need to listen to the desire. And then when you take that, if, if you desire an apple, you smell it. That's the second thing you must do. If it smells divine, eat it. If it gives you a wave of nausea, don't touch it. Mm. the wrong apple your body gave you a signal no 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 no. i don't want this apple look for another apple maybe another variety of apple maybe a, an organic apple you want or maybe an apple from a neighbor's garden which fell on the ground itself it's a different apple so after you've smelled it and it smells divine then uh, chew it and the taste will be divine if you get a wave of nausea from the taste wrong food hmm. Look for something else. Please read that chapter. It will explain it to you okay. how to That's manage uh, the diet uh, on an hourly basis for you. No doctor, no nutritionist can prescribe to you what you should have for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Yeah. Your body has to tell you that. It is your body that's doing the work and it has infinite wisdom and infinite knowledge. You need to just tap into that and listen to that. And that's the same for everybody. I love that um, article that you wrote, One Man's Meat is Another Man's Poison. Exactly. Um, it's on my blog as well, Dr. Natasha. Yes. I'll, I'll put the link in the notes for people. If they haven't read it, read it, then make sure you read it. And we'll, yeah, we'll put that in. It's on my blog and, and I have updated it and, and added more and put it as a chapter. Awesome. Which is very much to you. Okay. We should let you go because I feel like we'll take up too much of your time if we keep going. But wow, <laughs> have you got anything else you want to add, Buar, or ask? No, just a really big thank you. This has been such an yeah. incredible podcast with so much information. And so much, so yeah. we've been talking about these topics for so long. Joe and I have learned so many new things today, and it's yeah, just been an absolute beautiful. pleasure to have you here. Just um, this really such a 
amazing podcast. It's one of my favorites of all time. Thank you so much for Yeah, me here. too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Natasha. And um, bless you for all the things that you've done and all the people you've helped. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And bless you for your work as well. You're spreading the word and you're helping many, many people through your work. Thank you. Thank you. All the best to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.